Well, over the past couple of days, China's Xi Jinping and China's foreign minister took aim directly at the United States. Now, this is something they never do. In fact, they usually remain really diplomatic and only use neutral terms like some other nations when they're referring to anything negative, but not today. Instead, Xi Jinping said, quote, Western countries led by the U.S. have implemented all round containment, encirclement and suppression against us, bringing unprecedentedly severe challenges to our country's development. Those are really strong words. Encirclement, entrapping. Right? I mean, these are these are very, very. I mean, you might as well just say, um, you know, they're they're complete. It's, it's a, a blockade. With us now is Caleb Maupin, journalist and political analyst. Caleb, welcome to the show. Sure, glad to be here. Oh, uh, I mean, first of all, so the first criticism of this that people would claim is that the reason why China's Xi Jinping is making these statements and the reason why the foreign minister today, so China's Xi, uh, Xi Jinping said it yesterday, foreign minister said quite a few statements today, which actually, uh, we actually have a video of the foreign minister. Let's hear what he had to say first before we start talking about this, because it's, it's escalating every day. Here's the foreign minister. Yeah, so China's diplomacy has enough kindness and goodwill, but when wolves attack, Chinese diplomats must dance with wolves, defend the country. He went on in this and said, the U.S. claims to outcompete China but not seek conflict. In reality, this so-called competition of the United States is all-round containment and suppression, which is a zero-sum game of life and death. Really strong words. That's like war. Um, he says, I will first quote two sentences from the preamble of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. Taiwan is part of the sacred territory of the People's Republic of China. It is the sacred duty of all Chinese people, including Taiwan compatriots, to complete the great cause of reunification of the motherland. So really strong statements coming from both Xi and from the foreign minister. The criticism is the reason they're actually coming out and making these statements now is because Xi Jinping is in hot water. Things aren't going so great at home. People are financially struggling. China, you know, people are saying, oh, China's going to be going bankrupt in the next couple of months. You know, I've heard I've heard these sorts of things. And so he's feeling the pressure. So he's just looking to play, you know, place blame somewhere, a scapegoat. What do you make of that? Well, there's a lot that I could respond to there. I, I think this is a China is responding to real threats that have been made against them. When you have the U.S. Congress telling a Chinese corporation that they cannot build a new factory to make computer chips to sell in China because somehow this is a threat to U.S. power, that's ridiculous. I mean, you look at what's going on on the Korean Peninsula now, these very provocative drills rehearsing the all-out destruction of North Korea right on China's border. Um, and you look at the way, you know, there's this talk of, free competition. Huawei makes better phones than the United States. Uh, that's pretty clear. They make way better phones than iPhones, way better phones than, than American manufacturers do. And so instead of, you know, American companies just upping their competition, they try to squash Huawei. Uh, this is the approach the United States is having and China is responding. But as far as that last thing you mentioned about China's economy is about to collapse, I've been hearing that my whole life, and so have you. I mean, our whole life, China's just about to fall. It's just about to collapse. I remember back in 2015 when the Chinese stock market tanked. Do you remember that? And a week later, it was right back up because at the end of the day, all that had to happen was the Chinese Communist Party made some phone calls. They out outlawed short selling on the threat of arrest. Um, and then the Chinese stock market was right back up because the market really doesn't have the power in China. The Communist Party does. And that's what the recent meeting was about. I mean, the two sessions, that's where the, the People's Political Consultative Committee and the National People's Assembly, they gather. And it's about setting the economic agenda for the year. That is what the communist leaders are, are there doing. They are planning out the economy. They're there to make sure that the living standards continue to rise. They haven't seen the economic fallout from COVID that was expected. And they are predicting 
expecting a pretty strong GDP growth in the coming year. So I think that's the context here. The United States is trying to suppress China's economy because it's a competitor. I agree with you that that is actually the real root of this issue completely. I agree that fundamentally what happened was that China is a communist country. The United States is a capitalist country and the communists used capitalism against the capitalists, right? They came along and they said, oh, you have pretty much everything for sale. So we'll buy it. Why not? I mean, if we can invest in your companies, we can buy land, we can buy some of the most prominent buildings in the United States. Uh, we could buy your entertainment industry. They own, you know, I, I'm not sure what they own today and if they've divested, but I know that they were uh, like legendary entertainment, AMC movie theaters, the Waldorf Astoria in New York, t hundreds of acres of farmland in the United States. They own a lot. Um, and again, they own investments. A lot of companies are building products in China. They don't want to lose that labor. Um, and so there is, China essentially said, okay, well, you guys are up for sale. We'll buy it. And then when the U.S. turned around and said, well, then you should be up for sale, China said, no, you know, <laughs> that's not the way we do it. We're not putting ourselves up for sale. If you want to do business in our country, here are the parameters. We still own it. You can have 49%, up to 49%. You have to give us the patents. You have to do all of these things. And that was considered unfair. However, that being said, I do think that there, I mean, these are fighting words that China's using right now. Um, and, and this is not just about economics anymore for them, it seems. I mean, they are using language, containment, encirclement, suppression. Like I said, they might as well say blockade. And once you say blockade, that's war, right? Uh, same thing with wolves, where, you know, we, we're, we're, we've got to dance with wolves, or saying life and death. I mean, these are fighting words. Do you think China is now thinking, I guess the only way is to fight our way out of this? If they're not going to play the game of economics with us and compete, as you're mentioning, which I agree, that's what the U.S. needs to do. The U.S. needs to say, rather than just using military might, the U.S. instead needs to say, time to compete with an economic powerhouse that has risen largely off of our economy, but it happened, it's done. Okay, can't cry over spilt milk, it's, milk, it's over, right? We have to move on, we have to move forward. But I don't know, this sounds like they might be gearing up to, uh, I, I'm military, I mean, what do you think of that? Do you think that's a possibility? Well, first of all, we have to understand the context here, which is that when China was a deeply poor country, which is not very long ago, I mean, it's not very long ago that China was the sick man of Asia, mass malnutrition related deaths all the time, mass illiteracy. Before China developed and rose itself up out of poverty, the way it was kept poor was by keeping it divided right? You had Tibet in one area, you had a government, a uh, central government that wasn't being recognized. You had regions where warlords had power. And that part of the, the point that the Chinese Communist Party is always making is that they have held the country together. Deng Xiaoping said before the communists came to power, China was a, a heap of loose sand, but they brought the country together and they've held it together. So what the United States is doing with Taiwan, increasingly getting f closer to forces that consider Taiwan to not be part of China. What the USA has done with the, the Uyghur separatists uh, and with the Tibet separatist groups, uh, with the Hong Kong stuff, this is all a threat to the Chinese Communist Party because their maintaining of credibility depends on them making clear, we have held this country together. We have held this country together and we as a civilization that goes back 5,000 years, we're stronger when we're together. And when we're divided, when we're separated into different territories and regions, that's when we get poorer. And that's something that, that is a little bit difficult for us to understand. We have more of a Western Atlanticist worldview. We think in terms of the British Empire and seabound trade routes, but this is about Eurasia. And in Eurasia, where you have great land masses, territories are stronger when they are together, when they're trading with each other, when they're developing. Uh, and that's the context that the Chinese Communist Party is seeing this. They see the United States as trying to pull their country apart. Uh, and in response to that, uh, they, they are ready to defend themselves and they, they feel they've been attacked. Look, I mean, I, I don't have to break this down for you. I'm sure your audience knows it, but you know, China has one overseas military base. Russia has eight. The United States has well over a thousand. Uh, you know, I mean, China, you know, there have been military conflicts, but nothing compared to what the United States has been doing around the world. I mean, if you look at the number of U.S. military bases all throughout the Pacific, et cetera, uh, China is not the one that's the aggressor in this confrontation, I don't think. 
No, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's obvious. You're right. China has one in uh, in the Horn of Africa. That's it. And uh, and yeah, we're we have encircled them. I mean, they're right when they say they're 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 practicing containment, encirclement, suppression. I, they're not wrong. I mean, we just announced two more bases in the Philippines to complete the encirclement around them, um, for sure. So I, I definitely agree with that. But you know, it, when it comes to China, and I also agree that there is this narrative against China. I have a very nuanced take when it comes to China. No one likes my view, by the way, of China because every you know, I, one side says, oh, you're too soft, and the other side says, oh, you're too hard on China. <laughs> you can't can't make everybody happy. But um, I do think that there is a, a definite narrative against China that is inaccurate. The Uyghur situation is an inaccurate representation of what is happening there. They're calling it, you know, that it was called a genocide. And then when we said, OK, well, where are the bodies then? I mean, if you're going to call it a genocide, where's the death? And then people said, oh, OK, well, there's no evidence of that. So it's a cultural genocide, right? They shifted the they, they shifted it. OK, well, how is it a cultural genocide? Well, because the children are being forced to learn Mandarin. And it's like, well, they do live in China. I mean, it's like saying uh, children who Im I'm, I'm Vietnamese. My family immigrated here from Vietnam. It's like saying it was genocide for me to learn English when I was in school. I mean, that's crazy, right? That's just a crazy, a crazy. Um, and ultimately, the idea of trying to uh, boycott companies that have factories in Jinja in the Xinjiang region where the Uyghurs work is to keep the Uyghurs down so that they feel suppressed and then they want to rise up and continue with the separatist movement, you know, that would strengthen the separatist movement in China. I agree those narratives are completely wrong. However, I do think China is one to be watching. I, I do I, I do fear China. I, I am afraid that China has had, I, I do wonder, it's one of my thoughts that maybe they did have something to do with the virus, I know a lot of people are looking at Anthony Fauci right now, but I look at China and say, you were the only country who had a GDP that grew. Why is that? Uh, you're the only country that seems to have had some benefit from this virus spreading around and from lockdowns, uh, almost like it was orchestrated, showing videos of people falling down in the streets, which we know COVID doesn't do to people. But we had these images of people collapsing, and then they were saying, oh, we got to shut down everything. And knowing that that would harm us, that we were so reliant on the economy that that would harm us, I do think that they play a long-term strategy game of go. Uh, the Russians are playing a game of chess, and we're playing checkers here in the United States. We're playing child games. They know it. I do believe they look at Americans and they think Americans are stupid. And I'm not sure they're totally wrong. Uh, I do think that our politics are totally dumb. Our politicians are idiots. Uh, and they don't know how to play a game, a more sophisticated game of chess or go. And so the Chinese are beating us. And I do think that they're looking at their I think they're strategizing and I do think they're strategizing against us. And I do think they have people in their pocket like Bill Gates and the WHO and the World Economic Forum. And I worry that they're trying to march the globe into a system very similar to what China has, which is very authoritarian control over its population. How else can you control one and a half billion people? You have to big brother the hell out of them. And they do that. They have a credit, uh, social credit system and everybody's surveilled and there's digital currencies that they're rolling out. And to me, that's very scary. And I don't want to live under that. I don't want to live under that. You know, and I'm half Asian, half white. I get it. Like I grew up kind of in both, in both um, environments. And I love my Asian side of the family. I don't like the authoritarian, the tendency towards that that tends to come out and the, you know, no freedom of choice or freedom of speech, that stuff is not really valued as much. So that scares me. I don't know what you make of that. Well, again, a lot I could respond to. One thing I will point out is that in China, they call their system socialism with Chinese characteristics, and they make abundantly clear they have no desire to export their political system. If you look at the countries they trade with in Africa, the countries they trade with in Asia, they're not copying or exporting the Chinese political model to these countries. I, I just that, That's just not what they're in the interest of doing. And they understand their political system to be very China-specific uh, in many, many ways. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong, a 
adopted communism for China. Deng Xiaoping took it even further with socialism with Chinese characteristics. But the other thing I want to make clear is, you know, you said you talk about China being a threat and, and some concerns. I think our leaders here in the United States do consider China to be a threat. Because if you listen to Joe Biden's State of the Union, the opening was all about building, he's going to construct. If you listen to Donald Trump's recent remarks about the quantum leap and he's going to build 15 model freedom cities and all of that. This is what Americans want. We want construction again. We want jobs again. We want economic opportunities. We want a government that will oversee the development of the country. And our politicians are promising that because we want it. That's what we want. The, the country is falling apart in its infrastructure, train derailments, water not being properly purified, uh, the power plants are falling apart. And politicians are promising to do what China has done because China, with its central planning, with its five-year economic plans and its state-run industries and its communist party, has presided over a massive rebirth of the country. I mean, Trump says, make America great again. I mean, no country has ever been made great again. Uh, anywhere near as well as the Chinese Communist Party has, has rebuilt China. And also among younger people on the liberal side, there's all this interest in Marxism and socialism and communism. And instead of reading Judith Butler and Bell Hooks, they ought to be reading Xi Jinping and Deng Xiaoping because that is the success story. If you're interested in communism, there's no country that's been more successful with communism than China has been. And I think our leaders are realizing that their own shortcomings are comparable. And when you look, uh, when you look at how the United States is being managed, versus how China is being managed and how the United States treats its partners around the world compared to how China treats its trading partners around the world, uh, you can see that the United States isn't, isn't going to be in power for too long. And I think that threatens U.S. leaders. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I completely agree with you on many of those points. I will say I definitely am not a fan of communism. I have family currently still living in communism in Vietnam. Um, yes, their lives have drastically increased and gotten better from the time my family left Vietnam to where they are today. My family that's there in Vietnam now, they have a wonderful life, quite frankly. They don't have, there was a, a time period where they wanted to come and live in America. They wanted to join the rest of the family. They don't anymore. They live a wonderful life in Vietnam. But that being said, when I have conversations with them and we talk politics or anything that's kind of a controversial subject, they will stop the conversation at a certain point. They will say only so much. And then they'll say, I can't say any more because the government might be watching. Um, or if they want to travel, they want to go anywhere, they have to ask permission. There's just a lot of big brothering, a lot of rules, a lot of surveillance. It's that surveillance state I don't want to live under and many of us Americans don't. Um, so I, I understand there's so many people out there with like the rose colored glasses, but that's a, very few people who actually came from communism or have family currently in communism think it's a great system. Although you're right, the Chinese have built up over the last 30 years, but that is because also what you mentioned, they were in extreme poverty previously. So it's a lot, you, you can convince your population to take a job in construction, to take the jobs that other people don't want when it offers them an opportunity for getting out of that extreme poverty. We don't really have that as much here in the United States. Um, and so, I think it's going to be tough if we were, I don't know if we could recreate that same sentiment and mentality here. I just don't know if Americans born and raised in America really still want to take those manufacturing, go back to manufacturing or infrastructure jobs, right? I just don't know if they have it in them. I think everybody kind of has a, an entitlement where they feel like here in the United States, they're owed an office job or they're owed, you know, a job that's going to make them rich, not just a job that's going to keep them going or in the middle class, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think the mentality, because of where they were, I think like a lot of immigrants, when you have a country of immigrants, like America was, and a lot of immigrants, you know, we still have a lot now, but when the immigrants are allowed to really build the country, they're the ones that then develop into that middle class, but we've got so many people against immigrants, right? Because they're the ones then becoming the middle class. Uh, so it's just really complicated. It's fascinating. China is just one of those you know, we're going to be talking China for a long time over the next while, aren't we? Because it, there's just so much back and forth between the two countries. I just hope that the U.S. doesn't posture against China to the level where then we're spending a fortune on military, you know, and just keep doing it rather than building our own country up while China's building their country up because they're not building a thousand bases. You know, it's just... 
I don't know. I mean, do you think that the U.S. government is going to shift from from uh, Ukraine to China here pretty soon? What's your prediction on that? Well, look, I certainly hope not. But as far as what you said about civil liberties, I think what the Chinese Communist Party understands as they frame things in terms of historical and dialectical materialism is that freedom in any society is related to development. You know, no one anywhere in the world talked about human rights or the rights of man until like the 1400s in Europe. And that's not because people were just evil until then. It was because no society had reached the level of abundance to necessitate and and allow for that kind of freedom. Freedom is linked to development. And as China has gotten to be more economically prosperous, it has a lot more freedom. There's a lot more freedom of religion and freedom of speech in China today than there was back in like, say, the 19th. 1960s. Things have changed a lot as China has developed. But I am hopeful about the United States because when Donald Trump, when he met, went and met with Kim Jong-un and visited the demilitarized zone, that was a huge breakthrough. That was yeah. something that was a huge step forward. And I'm really hoping that that what Trump started on the Korean Peninsula can continue and that the, the, you know, the steps forward toward a foreign policy that's more about win-win cooperation, where countries trade in, in a way that is beneficial to other countries, where we focus on bringing peace through development, raising people up out of poverty, building schools and hospitals and providing economic opportunity, power plants. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so excited about what China's doing in terms of fusion energy, getting us beyond fossil fuels. All these climate change folks, they just want to make everyone poorer. They don't seem to be interested in getting beyond beyond fossil fuels to a higher fuel source. But that's what the interest I see in China. I think that there is a future for the United States and China to collaborate and cooperate. And that's what China wants. I mean, a lot of these programs they've attacked made in China 2025, China would like for those to be cooperative programs. Let American universities and uh, scientific researchers and companies team up with Chinese companies and, and develop new innovations together that will benefit all of humanity? Why, why view it in terms of a competition uh, when ultimately you know, economic competition between countries also often tends to result in military confrontations? That wouldn't be good for anybody. Yeah, I agree that. I don't think that their natural inclination is to uh, like imperialism in the, in the modern sense. I don't think that their natural inclination is to go out there and dominate. I agree that they're probably not really trying to export their way of thinking, but they're exporting it in order to gain favor. I do think that is something that they do. But um, yeah, I mean, it's very, it, it's, I, I, they are, it's an interesting, it's interesting. And, and your, your, your point is right. You know, the, the, you get freedom once you have more economic freedom. My mom was always saying that, you know, a tiger mom always, you go and study, study, you study and, uh, and become an engineer. And then when you make money, then you can go and sing karaoke all day, all night. <laughs> That's like literally, literally what she would say to me. And, uh, you know, just was like, you wait, you have to study all the time. You do your schoolwork, you become a doctor, an engineer, and once you make money, then you could go out there and have fun. But until then, you don't have a life. And that was really the mentality. So uh, I get it. I totally do. Caleb, thank you for being here. Sure. Always a pleasure. Thank you.